When I was six, I decided that I wanted to be an astronaut. My space career never quite took off, but I have tuned into cosmic radio and checked the latest extraterrestrial fashions on my own mission to understand space. Humankind has lived happily here on Earth for thousands and thousands of years. But over the last hundred or so, one or two people very brave, very bright people have dreamt of making that one giant leap into space. But I've never been entirely sure what the space race was all about. People are quick to point to non-stick pans and sunglasses and fire prevention stuff and even cordless drills. But is that really all we got from space? After all, it wasn't exactly a cheap day out, was it? I'm off to the place where the world felt the first impact of the space race in a rented space car. I love the fact that after just three trips to the moon, the Americans were so annoyed at having to walk everywhere, they decided to take a car. Go, Richard, go. He's got all your steering. It's great. The moon buggy, or the lunar rover vehicle, to give it its proper name, has to be the most expensive car ever made. It was $38 million. And that didn't include delivery. On the moon, its top speed was allegedly eight miles an hour. Here on Earth, the handling is not that great, to be honest, but it's not really a fair criticism because, of course, the gravity is all wrong. I bet you never heard that in a car test before. I have to say, it is a little bit breezy. But that wouldn't have been a problem at the Sea of Tranquility because there's no air, apart from the bit that blew the flag about. Anyway, here we are at number one Staveley Road, Chiswick, London, W4, the most unlikely address in the history of space exploration. This was an especially bad place to park at 6.44pm on the 8th of September 1944, because at precisely that moment, this whole end of the street disappeared in a huge puff of smoke. Six houses were flattened and three people were killed instantly. All that was left was a 10-metre crater in the ground. Whatever this explosion was, it seemed to have come from nowhere. Actually, it had come from Holland, where Hitler had launched it just five minutes earlier. Travelling at nearly 2,000 miles an hour, nothing had ever hit Chiswick so hard. It was a rocket, the first of hundreds of V2s launched by the Nazis, and it was also the fastest and most powerful machine of its time. But the rocket hadn't started life as a weapon, and its inventor wasn't German. Here he is, Robert Goddard, a true pyromaniac, a man who grew up fascinated by gunpowders and fireworks and blowing things up. And his ambition was to fly a man to the moon. But in 1910, when he started work on this, people had barely worked out how to get an aeroplane off the ground. And yet here was this bloke with a singed moustache saying he wanted to fire someone up vertically and so quickly that they would escape the pull of Earth's gravity. Pretty much everyone said he was a nutter. That was rubbish. Goddard's quest was to generate enough thrust to leave planet Earth behind. So he began experimenting with small rockets. And today, amateur rocketeers like Colin and Damien are still at it. You want me to uncoil this? Yes, just uncoil that. This is an electronic match. Yes. Goddard lit his rockets with a blowtorch on the end of a stick, didn't he? And then yeah. had to leg it. That's why his tash was all burnt up, I think. <laughs> Goddard started with models like these, basically big fireworks, stuffed full of gunpowder. <laughs> A 
And after 10 years of experiment, he went public, convinced his rockets would eventually fly to the moon. Now, of course, the press queued up and gave him a right good kicking, especially the New York Times, who pointed out that a rocket couldn't work in space because it's a vacuum, and the rocket would have nothing to push against in order to go forwards. <laughs> Two, one, fire! Goddard wasn't going to let a load of hacks get him down. He just got on with it and built his rockets bigger and better than ever. But he realised that gunpowder just wasn't up to the job. It would never have a serious chance of powering men to the moon. To do that, he'd have to invent a completely new kind of rocket. What we have now is a liquid fueled rocket, and the difference is very important. This is what Goddard worked out was needed, because with a solid fuel rocket, it's essentially like a bonfire night firework. Once you've lit it, all you can really do is run away. But with a liquid fueled rocket, you can control the flow of liquids with throttles and valves. You can turn it on and off in flight. You can vary the amount of thrust. You can vary the distribution of the fuel around the rocket body. The problem is, it is extremely complicated to do this. After more than a decade of watching his rockets explode in front of him, Goddard finally cracked it in 1926. The four-metre rocket he built worked on the same principle as this one. Three, two, one, initiate. Wow! That's superb. Can we do another one? Goddard's maiden flight wasn't a complete success. His rocket went up about 40 feet, and then two and a half seconds later, it crashed into a cabbage patch. Nevertheless, it was the world's first flight of a liquid-fueled rocket. And all he had to do now was tweak the steering a bit. But still, no one really believed in Goddard's rockets. Five. Except for the Nazis. Three, They'd taken great two, interest in his one, experiments. <laughs> And it was their version of his rocket that hit Chiswick in 1944. That's brilliant. After the war, the German engineers were interrogated by their American captors, who were very keen to know how the V2 worked. Well, said the Germans, just ask Goddard. Goddard died after the war, still dreaming of rocketing people to the moon. And that was a real shame, because among the mosquito-ridden swamps of Florida's Cape Canaveral, the greatest adventure of the 20th century, no, ever, was just beginning. At last, the USA bought into Goddard's ideas about rocketry, and by the 1950s they were building stuff like this, the Redstone and the Atlas, but they still hadn't quite seen his vision of propelling a man into space, because these things were originally conceived as missiles. They were instruments of war designed to carry a bomb on the top, not a man in a silver suit. But all that changed in 1957, when America was caught napping by the first ever spacecraft. It was Sputnik, a satellite launched on a Soviet rocket. This was bad news. It was very, very bad news, and it made the Americans kind of sore. And so, brimming with national pride and optimism, they prepared to get their own back on the Soviets. They would race them to the moon, and they would win, because, as we know, failure was not an option. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. He was right. It was pretty tricky. And the Soviets kept on notching up the firsts. First space dog, first space man, first space woman, and first space walk. By 1967, only the moon was left, and that would take a monster rocket. The Soviets had one that didn't work. The Americans had one that did. The Saturn V. There's an unused one here at the Kennedy Space Center, and its magic still draws us space buffs from all over the planet. I made the Airfix one when I was a lad. It was the best kit they ever did, because the Saturn V was the best subject in the world, and out of it. 
They couldn't physically build a rocket any bigger than this. If they had, it would have crumpled under its own weight. And when they filled it up with fuel, it actually sagged and became 16 inches shorter than it was when they started. But the thing that really amazes me is that this is the, the most powerful and most complicated machine ever built, and virtually all of it is disposable. The bit that comes back to Earth is so astonishingly small compared with the whole assembly. Look at it. As soon as this thing looked remotely like working, they were off, because this was a race, remember. There were two unmanned flights of the Saturn V, and on the third one, they put three blokes on the top, and they sent them round the moon. That's the right stuff. To build the Saturn V, NASA pretty much rewrote the rules of engineering and half the Guinness Book of Records. If you believe that the greatest innovations of the 20th century came out of sheds, and I do, to be honest, then that has to be the greatest shed of all time. That is where they actually assembled the Saturn V rocket up on its end as it was going to be launched in that building and at the time it was the largest building in the world. Only Boeing has since built a very slightly bigger hangar and it's guarded by alligators. Look at that. Of course they don't actually call it a shed because this is NASA so it has to have a completely pointless acronym. In this case it's the VAB, the Vehicle Assembly Building and it's FAB. It's actually still five miles away so uh, this could take a while. Today, the Space Shuttle is assembled here. Back when the first Saturn V was being put together for the Apollo moon mission, Charlie Parker was a 30-year-old NASA engineer. Charlie. Welcome. We're glad to have you here. A souvenir of NASA. Is that my, my own space hat? It's your own space hat. Whoa. Fantastic. Thank you. Oh, wow. How high is that? 500 feet. 525 feet. 525. The whole Apollo was 363 feet. The Saturn V rocket has about 6 million components in it, and the, the, the boast was that it was 99.9% .9 functional. But that still leaves sort of 6,000 bits that could be wrong. When you were in the last 20 seconds of the countdown, did you really believe it was going to work? Well, actually, in all of the manned space program around here, we who were not flying would always, when you got ignition, we were trying to help pick the vehicle up and lift it off the pad. Well, sort of spiritually. Kind of spiritually help, help it up. It wasn't just the rocket breaking records. Moving it from the VAB to the launch pad required a special vehicle. And, of course, it was the biggest one in the world. Its top speed, though, was under one mile an hour. This takes about six to eight hours to get out to the pad. Fuel consumption? About uh, 38 feet per gallon, something like that. It's three and a quarter miles to the launch pad. The Saturn V rocket was 363 feet tall and weighed almost 3,000 tons. Which meant that this vehicle had to do something like this to keep the whole Saturn V assembly upright. And to do that, it had a very, very sophisticated self-leveling device. That, again, was a first. Forty years on, the monster vehicle is still going strong, carrying space shuttles along the same stretch of road. At the far end is the launch pad, the starting blocks of the most expensive race in history. And you begin to see why America didn't get much change from its $25 billion. OK, we're going to make the walk that the astronauts make out onto the orbiter access arm. This is the walk. This is the walk. That is amazing. That is the gateway to the greatest That's adventure the that humankind. Yeah, the, the adventure occurs. So that is the doorway to that space. Is the doorway to space. On the day of the launch, when you're sitting there watching the whole process, did you ever want to swap places with the astronauts? At at that time, probably no, because I was much younger and I had a young family, and I probably would have said, "Hey, no, I don't, I'm not sure I would." Ask me today, would I fly if they, and I'd say yes. You would? I, I'd, I'd fly even if I knew I wasn't coming back. 
This bit I'm standing on now is the flame pit from the original Apollo era. I mean, all that stuff above is largely new. That's for the space shuttle. But this bit down below is original, and it's a sort of... I don't know, I can remember all those images on the television when I was a small boy and how exciting it was, and it happened here. This is where Saturn V would have lifted off. All this would have been full of flame and steam and the smoke from the cooling system. You couldn't have stood here, obviously. But it's like a... It's, it's hallowed ground, I suppose. It's a sort of temple to space. This is the point where man set off and went to the moon. It's really magical. We have the clock is running. Everybody here says God see. Four hundred thousand people worked to launch Saturn V. It was everything Robert Goddard had hoped for. With it, NASA beat the Russians to the moon and delivered the most famous broadcast in history. I was strolling on the moon one day in a merry We'd put our footprints on another planet, but that was it. Look at this. Off the ground. Only 12 men ever made it to the moon. And after a few years of absolutely intense excitement, the Apollo program was actually cut short and everybody just got back on with their Earth lives. So they parked up the lunar rover and they went home. Three, two, one, ignition. Right away, Houston. I think it's incredible that going to the moon will soon be something that has passed from living memory. That's a bit like discovering that the world is round and then deciding to forget about it. We need space. By rights, the moon landings should have been just the first step in a new era of interplanetary travel. Unfortunately, the 20th century also revealed that there was an unfeasibly large amount of space to explore. A hundred years ago, people who looked at the night sky through telescopes believed they could see the edge of the universe. The Milky Way was it. A big place, admittedly. It's about 100,000 light years across. But like most people in 1900, we knew our place in the general scheme of things. I have here a diagram of the general scheme of things. Here it is, and we are roughly there, about 30,000 light years from the center. And people believed that that's how things had been forever. But around the middle of the century, a new kind of stargazing machine came along and helped put an end to all that. Radio telescopes gave us a different view of the universe. They picked up signals from far outside our own galaxy. From places ordinary telescopes couldn't reach and they revealed that the universe was much busier than we thought. It was alive with weird signals, like messages from someone or something. They baffled astronomers on Earth. Just listen to the sound of this one. A very regular tick. Now, when this was discovered, no one knew of anything that could give rise to such regular pulses. They were better than clocks here on Earth. They thought, in fact, it might be an extraterrestrial civilization, and they called it LGM-1, Little Green Men 1. Well, now we know what these things are. They weren't ET at all, but pulsars, spinning stars, beaming radio waves across the universe like cosmic lighthouses, and each one had a different rhythm. That's going around about 11 times a second. It sounds like a triumph herald with a dodgy camshaft. Could well do, actually. Even better, radio telescopes scanned the universe to answer the biggest questions of all. How big is it? And how did it all begin, anyway? In the world of space, you can tell how important someone was by what was named after them. Entry level to the club is something like a museum. Robert Goddard, you'll remember him from the rockets earlier, he got a whole space center. But this man was so important that when NASA launched its giant telescope into orbit, they named it after him. Edwin Hubble. 
He really upset the general scheme of things. In the 1920s, he had worked out that the universe was much, much bigger than our galaxy, the Milky Way. There were billions more galaxies out there, all flying apart like debris from an explosion. He reckoned the universe had started with a big bang. It was such a wild idea, Hubble struggled to convince anyone. Until in 1963, radio telescopes picked up the most important signal ever, the echo of an explosion that happened 14 billion years ago. You can hear it yourself if you detune your telly. Part of that hiss is the afterglow of creation, the beginning of our universe. Probably not a good idea to lie around thinking about all this too deeply. It's not terribly good for our planetary self-esteem. I mean, originally we were the centre of everything, and then we were told we were just a planet in a solar system. Then the next thing you know, the solar system was part of a massive galaxy, and now, apparently, that galaxy's got billions of galaxy mates. So it's not just that we're a bit small, or even that we're a bit insignificant. It could be that we really don't matter. That was Hubble's legacy. He changed the way we see ourselves in the universe. But I'm a practical man, and for me, having my mind expanded is not enough. The first satellite, Sputnik, was little more than a bang and a beep. But just five years later, the Americans launched Telstar. It looked a lot like R2-D2, and its job was to transmit telephone and TV signals across the Atlantic. It was the start of satellite communication. But less than a year after it was launched, Telstar was knocked out, ironically, as a result of the Americans' own high-altitude atomic bomb tests. It was up there long enough, though, to show that this whole space malarkey might just be useful. If you want to know about satellites, there's only one place to come. Mission Control, Guildford. This is where we control our satellites from. This is actual Mission Control? Yeah. Do you mind if I say I'm a little bit disappointed? <laughs> it does look as if David Brent's about to walk in. <laughs> People are always saying that, oh, they've got satellites in space and they can look down and they can read your newspaper when you're sitting on a bench in the park. Is that actually true? That's not true, no. It's not? So, but what about Google Earth? Because that's got pictures. I can see my car. If they start out with a big satellite image, and as you zoom in, it gradually turns into an aerial photograph, which has been taken from an aeroplane. And what is the smallest thing you could see, clearly? Well, with our satellites, our best one that we've done is TopSat, and that can image at about two and a half metres resolution. So each pixel is two and a half metres by two and a half metres. Well, it's not every day you get your hands on a camera in space. So I've grabbed the Mission Control crew over lunch and I'm going to lay out a picture on their lawn. To make sure it shows up on TopSat, right out there in orbit, I've made it from two and a half metres squares. OK, you need a sandbag over there. Now, all that's required to reveal the beauty of my space art to the world is for the satellite to pass overhead. If you look at this image up here, you can see lots of dots very close to the Earth. There's low Earth orbiting imaging satellites. They're at about 686 kilometres high. Medium Earth orbit, which is about 20,000 kilometres, and that's GPS. Then the big ring round the outside is the belt where all the geostationary communication satellites are, which is out at 36,000 kilometres, much further away. Do those dots represent actual satellites? Yeah, they're actual satellites. There are that many up there. This graphic shows about 900. I had no idea it was that many. But it, this is crowded. Presumably in another 100 years, the Earth will look like Saturn with a sort of asteroid satellite belt thing around it. Yeah, that sort of thing. I'm staggered there are that many satellites up there, beaming phone calls all over the place and helping us navigate our way to the shops. And who knows what else, to be honest. So the first requirement of working in the space business is that you 
you have to not mind looking a complete burke, isn't it? Well, we need to protect ourselves from getting sort of dirt and debris into the spacecraft, obviously. Wow, look at that in there. Oh, don't touch, don't touch. You've got to be very careful around the satellite. So it, that, that is, is a satellite? This is a satellite, yeah. This is all going to space. It's an imaging spacecraft. It's all very, very nicely made. There is no space fluff in here. Whenever I go to something like a car factory, I always insist that I put a bit on somewhere so that I know there's a car somewhere in the world driving around with a bit of me in it, a I bit that I made. Ask. So can I put... I really like the idea of putting something on a satellite that's going to go into outer no, space. We can't do that. Why not? You've got to be highly qualified to work on these what, satellites. Not, <gasps> don't touch. <laughs> I was going to ask where the thruster is, and is that it? That's the thruster. That yeah. is the space thruster. It's a small thruster on this spacecraft, yeah. It's tiny. I do have a slightly tragic enthusiasm for nuts and bolts and things. So this is real flight hardware. Oh, wow. Can I touch one? Yeah, go on. Sure. That is going to go into space. Then it'll become a space bolt. Mm -hmm. That one could be chosen. Yeah. Do you still get a bit of a kick? as I'm doing at the moment, looking at that and thinking, that will eventually be in outer of course, space. Yeah, of course, it's but pretty why cool. Why is that isn't exciting? It? But it is oh, cool. Yeah, it is cool. Shall we go and have a cup of space tea? Space tea, definitely. And a space canteen. But what about my space photo? Well, let's have a look. There's Guildford, and if I zoom right in, there it is. A message to any passing satellite. My version of a space invader. And not a bad likeness, to be honest. Well, not bad from 700 kilometres away anyway. Top notch. Mission Control Guildford, you did not have a problem with that. Maybe satellites are the only really useful thing we've got out of space. Or maybe I'm just barking up the wrong tree and space has changed our lives in a much deeper way. I should really ask a proper astronaut. Funnily enough, I did meet one. John Blaha's been into space five times on the shuttle. He spent nearly six months in orbit. But look, I don't want to ask you all those normal, boring questions about what's it like going into space and so on, okay. but you are an astronaut. Okay. What were your feelings about yeah. the planet Earth when you saw it from right up there? My first thing, and it just roared my pants down, literally. It was that really? startling was our atmosphere. You see uh, planet Earth, this blue and white sphere, and surrounding it is a very thin little light blue halo. When you realize what that is, you, it just kills you. Human beings need to figure out how to make sure it stays there, or we won't have to worry about figuring anything else out. The space race really grew out of quite militaristic ideas. It was a Cold War phenomenon, but it seems the enduring legacy of it is possibly a greater craving for peace in some ways. I think without a doubt its greatest legacy has to be we learned that planet Earth was a very fragile planet and we better start watching what we're doing to it. Brilliant. We could probably cut there, couldn't we? What is it like going into space? Oh, it's, it's the best job in the world. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night. And God bless all of you on the good earth. I doubt that anybody ever anticipated the impact that picture would have, the blue marble, the first ever view of the earth in its entirety and the most reproduced photograph in history. The commander of the Apollo 9 mission said that he felt lucky to be looking down like a guardian angel on all of history and music of life and love. And it's not like he was a hippie or anything. So, to those people who say the space race was a complete waste of time and money, well, as somebody once said, we went in search of the moon, but we discovered the Earth. For a free hands-on activity pack from the Open University, simply phone 0870 900 0352, or you can log on to open2.net. Next time, I find out what happens when I push my body to its limit and beyond.